Good evening, Santa River here. Welcome to Monday Night Muse, where we will be talking about collaboration. I hope you guys are all doing well. I'm going to go ahead and check the audio on the YouTube playback real quick and go ahead and leave a comment on, on how audio is. You know, you know the routine. You know the rules. It sounds uh, pretty good on my end, so uh, hopefully, I, I, I do feel like it's um, a little bit low. The output is a little bit low, but uh, <clears throat> I'm I'm fine with just yeah. Uh, my my gain is pretty much all the way up, so hopefully you can hear me. Let's uh, see how that is. We can hear you. Sound is clear. Good. Audio is good. Very good. I'm glad. I, I, you, you know me, I'm, I'm all about good, high quality audio. So let's welcome the chat, see how you guys are doing. And then we'll just talk about collaboration. You know, it's, it's artistic collaboration, but I would say more or less that could be applied to any kind of uh, field or experience, business, all that. All right. So I know Al was first. I saw, I think it was around... 7.30 or something, where he says first, and then Professor says first in her heart, which is very true. And I just want to just take the time to thank the prof for a delicious dinner. I wasn't feeling good yesterday. I had the I had all the symptoms of a migraine coming on last night. Um, so he, he made sure to ask me if I was okay, made sure if I was okay the following day for my teaching and my stream, and, uh, and, and low Lo and behold, it was a Panera, Panera bread soup and a, a fruit cup and a piece of bread and some cookies or just one cookie. And I was really happy about the flavor of cookie. It was it was a sugar cookie with lemon frosting, which I love lemon, uh, but I can't do chocolate. I gave up chocolate for Lent. So I'm like, oh, no, he, he gave me a cookie. Well, if it's chocolate, I'm going to have to freeze it. But it wasn't. It was a lemon flavored sugar cookie, and I was really happy. And it was it was good. All of it. It was so good. It was creamy tomato soup. And then I steamed some broccoli and I feel great. So thank you. Thank you, my love. You are first in my heart. I hope, of course, I am first in your heart too. <laughs> and we've got Netter's Network and saying she is third. So of course, Prof is second, Al is first. And we've got Matthew Flynn saying, hello, I'll be wor working on my G1 Transformers book in the background. Good. I love, you know, that's what I do for streaming too, by the way. When I listen to people's streams, if I have time or if I'm at home, I'll be working on some music project in the background or something that doesn't take a lot of uh, listening as far as my, my music, you know. I can edit my scores. I can do miscellaneous teacher admin stuff. And so that's good, yeah. I like that you guys are working in the background. And Wolf10 says, oh, hey, there's Sound Engraver. And Melissa Harrison sends, good to see you, Melissa. And also Horizon Talker, welcome. And Dr. Y is in the house saying the doctor has arrived. The doctor of what exactly? The doctor of curiosity. Why? Because who was taken? Exactly. <laughs> All right. I think that's everyone so far today. Oh, wait a second. Sco Schooner Tuna says I am here. Good. And there's Big Al. That's a good man there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's... You know, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Christian, so I believe that, you know, if I have... God, if I have Jesus, that's that's everything right there. But man, I don't know. Life is looking a little impossible without him. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Weiss says, uh, Saturn Griver, come to the Protestant side. We have cookies. Well, actually, the thing is, I am Protestant. Yeah, I'm dating a Catholic, but I am I am Protestant. So, so it's very interesting. Oh, I see. Uh, Jedi Masters Utopia, and I think I see someone, Samuel Proctor. Sound is good on this Sound Engraver stream. Oh, well, there we go. Awesome, awesome. So, 
yeah, I hope everyone's doing well. I hope everyone had a nice weekend and, you know, you, you are ready to start the week with work or projects or whatever you're doing. And uh, before we get started on my talk on collaboration, as my share also a sense, uh, I wanted to give you an update on my, my album. And that is, it's good news. We do have my sound engineer, if, if you haven't seen my website or you haven't um, been on the Facebook group page, my mastering engineer, he, he was out of a workstation for about one to two weeks. I think it was an internal computer problem. So I, I can't imagine being out a workstation. You know, I have my desktop here. So if something internal happens to my desktop, I'm pretty much out of my composing work in Logic Pro and Super Collider for whenever I get a new computer. I have everything backed up, but you know, this is my main computer I work on. So that's what happened to him. I think it was internal. He did get uh, a piece of equipment, a, a, a supply piece end up not working. So he installed a lot of plugins on his laptop and now he's working on my album out of his laptop. So he, he got my fifth song and I got the mix I wanted on my fifth song and I sent him my sixth song. So we are on six, song number six of eight songs before my album is completely mastered. It's the first of March. I would really like this released by March 8th, 9th. That would be wonderful, um, but we'll see, we'll see. So this is actually part of collaboration. This is kind of why I'm talking about the talk tonight is that there are hiccups sometimes. There, there are things that are outside your control and you know, what do you do with that? You have a deadline, well, what, what do you have to do when you have to postpone that deadline and all of that good stuff? So anyway, uh, I think I'll just go ahead and pull up my notes and I think that's everyone. I think I've greeted everyone. Welcome if I haven't greeted you. I do see 16 people live. Oh, 18, that's great. That's even better. <laughs> so um, let's go ahead, I'm gonna pull up my notes and I don't think it's too long. I'll read through them, see what you guys think, and we'll have a discussion. Any questions that you have on collaboration, just let me know. I'm I'm a professional musician. I'm a teacher. I'm getting into the professional projects, you know, the, the, the professional mindset of my composing, uh, give or take about three to four years of experience, uh, seeing, seeing what's working, seeing what's not working. And so hopefully I can give you some good feedback. I mean, I technically am a professional composer because I do make money on my music. How much money? Uh, that's to be decided later this year. We'll see. <laughs> so let us pull notes and uh, we'll take it away. <clears throat> Pull out our notes I meant to say. All right. Okay. So what to expect in a collaboration? Of course, I'm an artist. I'm more or less going to be talking about artistic collaboration, but this can apply to any kind of collaboration, business or otherwise. So the first thing to establish, whether you have one person on your team a multitude of people on your team, you know, small team, large team, just another partner, whatever the case may be. The first and foremost thing, the thing to the thing to be decided upon is is this project amateur or professional? Are you of the amateur mindset or are you of the professional mindset? Is this project or product going to be something of the amateur or something of the professional. So let's go ahead and clear some of this up. What do I mean by amateur? Well, it's not a bad thing, you know, and amateur can be used disparagingly, I think, and I'm not using it in that way. I'm not uh, saying anything bad about being an amateur. But when you're thinking of amateur or the amateur mindset, it's thinking, thinking of your skills, your craft, all, all that goes into your art as more of a hobby. You know, it's more relaxed. You're not thinking of having a final project. You're not thinking of having a finished project. And you're certainly not thinking of having it in a business sense that, that you're working toward branding yourself or uh, marketing yourself to provide a service, 
a skill or an actual tangible piece of craft or a product. So this is very, very important to distinguish amateur from professional, not just, not just you on the team, but also all your team members, you know, people you are collaborating with. You can't, you can't go into the profession or you can't think of this professionally minded or with a professional mindset, I should say. You can't think, okay, I'm going to have a final product. We're going to sell it as a service. We're going to sell it as a product to be valued and, and uh, a project to sell like, like a painting or um, a film or a music album, whatever the case may be. You know, you can't have that mindset. And then other people on the team, as skillful as they are, they can't have the amateur mindset saying, ah, no, we're just having fun. You know, I think the the best example I can give is, you know, I've had this experience as a musician where I I want to play the violin for money. I love the violin to bits. I can play it for the rest of my life for free. I enjoy the the performance and the, the playing that goes into different songs and classical repertoire, but I also can use it as a skill. I can use it as a service. I can charge a lot of money for my violin playing. And so if I have a few people that say, hey, we want to get you on a band here. We want you to play fiddle. And this has happened to me. You know, uh, we'll do rehearsing. We'll do performing. Uh, we'll record some albums and stuff like that. And I've I've been on the professional set where these are professionals and, and they mean business when they're out in a bar performing or, or people are saying, nah, we just want to hang out and we just want to, we just want to create some sounds. You know, we just, we just want to experiment. You know, we're, 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 we're some, we're friends, you know, we just, we just want to have like a a good time and and that's fine if you want to have a good time, but you can't go into that kind of setting with, with a band and, and be the person who said, well, I want to market ourselves. You know, I want to market this thing as a band. I want to, I want to do rehearsing. I, I want to do, live sessions. I do want to sell albums. I do want to sell merchandise. And then you have, you know, two or three others in the band saying, Oh no, we're just jamming. We're just, we're just having fun. It's just, it's just not going to work. There's going to be a lot of uh, points of contention with something like that. So either everyone is on the amateur mindset saying, okay, we're just good. We're doing this to have fun. You know, we're doing this to hang out or the professional mindset. Yes. I, we, We'd like to do this as a profession. We'd like to go on tour. We'd like to play at shows. We'd like to market ourselves as a legitimate band. So that's the first thing before vision, before passion, before the project itself. You got to decide if it's amateur or if it's professional. Amateur is not bad. Professional is not all there is but it has to be decided between you and the person you're working with or the team of people you are working with. So that's the first thing. So let's continue on down the notes. If you and your team members or your band or whatever the case may be, you know, if you in the collaboration have decided that this is going to be professional, this is going to be something you're going to develop like a game, like maybe you're a game developer and you need, uh, you need a programmer, Uh, an animator, or maybe you do that. Maybe you do program the animation. Maybe you have uh, a storyboard artist, concept artist, uh, you know, composer, you know, like I, like, like I can do, uh, or a mastering engineer, you know, all that stuff, you know, post-production team, all that good stuff. So you are out to make this game or you are out to make this project, a final product to give to the world, to offer the world, uh, with with something in return, with something in exchange. So the first thing, now that we've established uh, a professional mindset among your group of people, well, we do have to have a vision. So that's that's the first thing. Have a vision. It must be pretty unified. You You must have the same idea, the same, I would say, level of excitement. So the, the vision must be the same. And I would say, this might sound pretty bold, pretty forward, but I think this is pretty important. Everyone must have the same vision mind, same vision in mind for the product, and they must share the same love and care for the final product. So for example, if it's about making money for this one product, everyone must share the same philosophy 
when making a profit. You can't have someone in the group, for instance, this is kind of getting into the amateur mindset. You can't have someone in the group as skillful as they are say, well, I, I don't like the idea of making a profit of, of doing this when everyone else is saying, no, we'd like to make this game to sell it. We'd like to make this album to sell it. You know, so you, you have to be unified in that sense. So, you know, if you have someone who has a negative view on making the profit, you might actually want to consider letting them go for their sake too. I don't think they would be comfortable with a group of people who have another vision in mind. Now, if, I would say that that, um, as I had said before, that is the amateur mindset. So make that distinction and be honest with yourself and also honest with people around you. Have them be honest with you, whether they want to actually develop a game for fun as a hobby or develop a game to be sold in the market. I would say if I would actually say that the the mindset professional amateur actually will dictate the impl the implementation of skills, um, which can negatively affect the group if it's more of the amateur mindset. Uh, so when I sell an album, the the number one goal I have for selling an album is superior audio quality. Yeah, superior composition. No no question. I am a composer. But at the end of the day, even, even if I'm not entirely satisfied with my, my composing or my composition pieces, knowing it'll get better in the future, the one thing I want in that product is audio quality, like superior audio quality. You know, audio quality that just does not um, get... I, I do have a standard. So anything I catch, I'm like, okay, let's, let's nip this in the bud. It could be like... Uh, high frequency leaking or aliasing or too much reverb or too much delay. So, you know, even if the composition is not quite, quite what I want, I want good audio quality. That's my professional mindset. So, so my professional mindset dictates the implementation of my skills. And so that positively contributes to the production of my music album. Someone with an amateur mindset may have the same amount of skills as I have as a composer. But if they don't have the same idea like, oh, I want this to be a polished product, I'm just doing this for fun, it actually would dictate how they go about things. Could, could actually render something maybe half-hearted or careless or whatever the case may be. So everyone must share the same or similar passion, care, and love for the project or the product. And I would say that when this happens, the best skills, the best effort, and the best use of resourcefulness takes place. I think all of this takes place. All right, so that's your vision. So you are unified, you have the same vision. The next is skill. When you have a professional mindset and your team of people have the same professional mindset, it's really, really important. I've, I've experienced this myself too. It's really important to have a team of people who are at the same level of skill. It doesn't need to be the same level of skill in a field. So I'm a good composer. And yeah, maybe I would also collaborate with a composer who is just as competent in music as I am. But it could also be an animator. It could be a programmer. It could be a concept artist. It could be a writer. You know, the person should be on the same level of competence in writing, for instance, as I am in composing. So everyone more or less should be at the same skill level. For instance, my mastering engineer is very, very good at what he does. This is important to me as a composer who is skilled in electronic music. He just has a knack for detail. He has a, a very uh, a good sense of hearing, very cute sense of hearing. He, he just knows what to pick up. He knows what the composer wants. I don't know how he collaborates with other artists under his label, but with me, it's like, oh, you want this? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this to you. Okay, let's try this. Okay, you want me to experiment with this? How does this sound? And when I say, hey, it doesn't work, then he's fine. He's ready to either fix it or move on, and he's very, very patient. This is a professional engineer I'm working with, and it makes me also professional. It makes me want to do things and say things that help him along the road as well. Make it easy 
for him. I don't ever want to be that artist that inconvenience, inconveniences him. So that's very important. You, Whoever you're working with, whatever they do, it could be completely different from what you do, but they have to be the same at the same or very similar, very close level of skill in their field. This is my experience as an artist. Um, I, I, I would say it's very it's very uncomfortable to be in a collaboration where you are not as skilled in your field as people are in other in their fields in their respective fields. Uh, I, I was in a it was kind of embarrassing. I'll never forget it. I was uh, in this freelance work where I thought I had the chops. I I thought I had the chops for composing and sound design, and it was for a podcast in from from for someone in Australia and he got back to me and he was really disappointed because I just it was so subpar and that was five years ago I'd have looked at it and I'm, I would be thinking oh that that really is subpar I don't know I I don't know what I was thinking trying to uh, get that professional podcast sound so I was really embarrassed by the whole thing he he reprimanded me he he wasn't happy it just didn't feel good and we kind of called it quits there um, so I was at the I was in the position where I was not as skilled as he was in his profession, you know, whether that was um, uh, podcast, radio personality, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, it could be vice versa. You know, you could find yourself wanting to collaborate with people, but they are not at the skill level that you are at with your craft. And so to make things easier, just kind of just kind of gauge it. You know, I'm not asking you to be a. Um, professional or critic on, on a speci speciality that is not yours, but kind of, kind of gauge, like say, Oh, like, are, are they intermediate? Are they at an advanced level? Are they professional? Are they just starting? You know, maybe they just want to start with you, but you know, you've got 10, ex you know, 10 years of experience and they have maybe six months, eight months experience. So kind of, kind of watch out for that because it can be in, you, you could find yourself in a very uncomfortable position when the skill levels are not the same or even close. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we've got vision and skill. The next is responsibility. Everyone must have a healthy sense of time and uh, honor deadlines. So if you have a plan to create art on a prolific scale, the rest of the team should too. So what, what do I mean by prolific? Is this a one-time shot with the team? Or are you thinking of developing other things with the team? Maybe it's a game developer wanting to do another project after the game is finished. Maybe it's a band who wants to do a, a single track or maybe like a mono track of you know, 60 minutes or something like that. Or maybe a 10 track music album. Do people have in mind to keep working with you? Is it a one-time thing or are they, you know, do, do you guys have chemistry? Do you, do you guys think, oh, yeah, let, let's keep working at this. Let's keep getting better at what we do. This is our first project. Uh, let's let's keep working down the months, down the years. So, for instance, my engineer, I'm going back to me because we're, we're in the middle of uh, working on an album. My engineer is very happy about the prospects of me doing multiple music projects per year. So I, I hope if, if nothing happens this year where, where I'm, you know, where I stop, where I need to stop composing and, and making music, um, you know, I, I still have, let's see, after this album, I have two albums plus half an album. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking also to working on a couple single tracks. And so he likes the idea, you know, he, he's fine with the idea of putting a lot of music out there under my name, uh, under my artist's name. Um, so because of that, he actually shares that professional outlook and, 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 and does it in a way where he gets my tracks back to me mastered in a timely manner. And we've worked long enough together for him to know my musical sensibilities, what I want with the acousmatic space, what, you know, how, how tight I like to make the electronic sound. He, he knows what I expect. And I'm, I'm actually getting to the point where my music albums uh, share tracks that are unique. Each, each track is unique, but every track has this, this, uh, 
vibe and mood and feeling where he has a template now. He he has a template of my music to work in. Okay, he want you want this nice and tight. You want this sounding distant. You want this you know you know toned down and and backed away. He he actually has a few templates to work with on my color on my instrumentation. So there's a huge advantage of working with someone um, many months and and say, oh, okay, yeah, you you know what you want uh, with this. So uh, because of that, an album for me takes an average about three to four weeks to master. And this goes without hiccups or halts, you know, and I, of course you, you know that I have a, a little bit of a halt with the, his being out of a workstation. But he and I have this professional, this mutual, under, mutual understanding where it's like, okay, you want this, you, you want the sound nice and professional, nice and tight, superb audio quality, and you want to do a lot of music this year. Okay, I'm on board. He has a mutual understanding. He he respects that. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i making music for his label, so <laughs> I, I, I would hope he would respect that. Uh, but that shared sense of responsibility, that, that shared sense of, okay, let, let's get this done out on time and let's make some money off of this music. And so I think, yes, I, I did write time and uh, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and uh, review what I had said about time since it's in my notes. Okay. So we've got vision, skill, and responsibility, also time. So it's really best if you have worked with a number, uh, it's really best if you've worked with a person a number of months and years, um, just, just knowing your, you know, their sensibilities, your sensibilities with all that. Um, if you're new, if you're just starting out, you know, you and your team must understand the time and effort that goes into a project. Uh, that comes with personal artistic experience. So before knowing this mastering engineer and also his label, I had been composing a number of weeks and months and, and practicing every day and, and getting the sense of, okay, how do I structure a piece? How do I add instrumentation? How do I finish a piece? So that actually takes personal artistic experience. So if you're on your own right now, uh, whether drawing or writing, sketching, all that good stuff, you already know. You already, if, if you've practiced a long time, and, and I've seen people, you know, like Dr. Y, for instance, um, you know, you, you have an idea of how long a sketch takes. You have an idea of how long the coloring takes. You, you know your software, you know your routine. So be honest and be transparent with someone saying, hey, this, this is how long it takes me to do this. And, and let them be transparent about that with you too. So know your time, know, know how much time, have, have enough self-awareness of like, okay, this, this takes this time, this takes this time. I'll, I'll get back to you in this week and, and all of that. So if you're new, that's, that's what I would say up front, you know, have have that honesty, have that transparency between all of you saying, hey, it takes me this time, it takes me this amount of time, this amount of days to complete this assignment you're wanting and all of that. And on self-awareness, that's that's the other thing, uh, know what you don't know and be honest about that. Know what you don't know and, and say it with all transparency. Also have your team members be transparent on what they know and don't know. So for instance, if someone approached me, let's say a game developer approached me for a mobile game and, and they liked my composing, they liked my music. They said, you know, we could really use your music for these, these puzzle games or maybe some world building for this computer game. I think I could do that. I think I have, if, if they want the electronic music style, I think I could do that pretty, pretty well. I could adapt. Of course, it'd be a huge learning curve for me for this kind of intensive collaboration, but I think I could adapt. The same is, the same is true with a commercial, whether it's me doing a voiceover with, with my speaking or my music, I'm comfortable with providing attractive music to things like commercials, like, you know, a real estate, commercial. Like, let's look at these beautiful homes and, and listen to this beautiful music. I could do that. I could do that pretty well. What I wouldn't be comfortable with is a film. So if someone approached me, a, a film producer or filmmaker, and, and they said, hey, we want to do a historical documentary on, you know, this, this event 
this group of people in the late 1800s, but we want an orchestral score. Will you do it? I would actually decline and try to find them another candidate because I have not worked with orchestrating with the orchestra in 10 or more years. I just do not have the chops to score for an entire orchestra. I can score for a string quartet. I can score for an ensemble, but that still would take a lot of time for me. Whereas if, you know, let's say it's a documentary on a kind of mysterious hummingbird or something, you know, it's like a nature documentary. Well, I think then I could, because that kind of setting could rely more on the electronic sound. But any project regarding the orchestral score, even a gaming project, I would say you're going to have to find someone else because I'm really fast in electronic music. I am not fast in orchestra music. This would this would take a lot of relearning before I could ever get back into like the Howard Shore territory, you know, composing for Lord of the Rings and all that. I just know my skills well enough to say, hey, let me find you another candidate. And so, yes, have self-awareness and be honest and also have other people be honest what they can do, what they can't do, what they're comfortable with, what they're uncomfortable with. Um, and, and also, you know, really what they know, what they don't know. It's all about transparency and self-awareness. And finally, communication. Communication. Always with every exchange, with every meeting, with every email, with every text, always have decorum, show decorum, be kind, be responsible, be polite, be clear with what you want in the collaboration, but always, always be kind and patient. Uh, problems do happen. They, they do happen and it's best not to burn any bridges. That was one thing that I had a supervisor, I'll, I'll never forget him. He, no matter how bad the situation was with a project, he was a project manager supervisor, project manager, supervisor, he would always say, no matter how bad it is, I want to exit the project without burning any bridges. So that's the best thing you can do also in a collaboration is, is show respect, show decorum, be kind, be clear, be transparent, and I'll always be professional. So let's review all that. Not all that, but you know, the, 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 the several points that I made for the, the professional mindset. Now, before I begin with that, remember, if you're doing a collaboration, just, just remember if you want it to be amateur as a hobby for, you know, self-enrichment or, you know, just, just something that's fun to do, uh, just, just be aware if, if you're about that, then everyone else should be about that. But if you're professional, everyone else should also have that professional mindset. And if you are choosing that route, if you are choosing the professional way, the professional mindset, you have to have a shared vision. You have to be at the same level of skills. You have to have the same sense of responsibility. You have to honor time. You have to have enough self-awareness and transparency, and you have to provide great communication. So that's what goes into collaboration. I hope that was in a, I hope that was informative and helpful and insightful and we will go ahead and take a look at the chat so it's 10 4 and <laughs> As the professor says first in my heart love take notes gent yeah actually so guys if you're trying to like impress a girl i mean really i mean the, like okay so you got to you got to know this about me. I was I'm a total introvert who was not looking to date anyone. Like I just the idea of dating just like nope. But somehow the prof like he he's a total gentleman. Like he just he he takes care of me. That's not an old fashioned idea. So so guys, if you if you want to win the girl's heart, be there for her. You know, just be there. You know, champion her heart by. Uh, just, uh, I don't think that I phrased that right, but, you know, um, uh, melt her heart, sweep her off her feet by just taking care of her. And it, it can be little things too. And it's, it's amazing what the, what the prof does. And 
Um, I'll say, I'll say something random. Like, cause I, like, I don't even mean it. I'll say, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had some old tattered slippers. I need to get, I need to get new slippers. And then like a day later in the mail at my door, there's a pair of slippers. It's like, Oh, that's so kind. That's so nice. Dr. Y says, oh, that's right. Catholics get Jesus cookies every Sunday. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's true. <clears throat> Dr. Y says, uh, I'm going to be working on a drawing video while listening. Horizon Talker says, I contracted some logo work and the process got delayed for a week because the guy doing it lives in Texas. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I th think that could happen. Mm -hmm. Daniel Craig says, I know two guys who started band to be uh, successful and make money, but they're having a hard time finding drummers bassists who uh, take it seriously as a job. See, yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're a musician and people are saying, hey, we, we need a drummer, we need a bassist, and let's say you're a bassist. I mean, and, and they're professionals and they make money. Oh my goodness, you better be on your A game. You really do have to be on your A game as a musician. You've got to show up on time for the rehearsals. You've got to stay extra late just in case, just to get that song right. You've got to you, you got to make it to the show like 45 minutes to an hour early. Well, well, especially if it's a band with a lot of setup and a lot of gear, it's even earlier than that. Uh, for me, like if I'm just doing acoustic violin, it is so easy. All I need is a microphone and I'm ready. <laughs> uh, but if I had backing tracks, yeah, I'd get those backing tracks prepared and, and make sure it's good sound quality, make sure it's um, playing on the speakers just right and all that. I mean, I, since since 2020 the pan pandemic i haven't i haven't performed at all it's really really sad um and it's it's not the same but i i do hope to do virtual performances soon and and they'd be high quality audio i i, I would make sure it's it's in a good studio setup it's good audio mic mic'd everything but you know actually i might actually do obs with my computer and just have a mic and uh, play along with some super collider. I do have that in mind for this year too. But yeah, I mean, Daniel, I, that's, I, I don't understand people going into a band that actually makes money, even how little the money is and, and not take it seriously. That's that, that would be, that would be a problem. That would be a huge problem, especially, especially the drummer. You can't have a half hearted drummer. The drummer is really what makes the band. It can make the band. It can break the band. It's really, really important. I mean, every every part is important for sure. But there's something about the drums. Like when the when the drums are nice and tight, you just and like it, it. It's a surge of energy to the other musicians as well. I knew a guy with a band I used to talk to. Uh, I used to talked music with. He said he wanted to do a collaboration with me and seemed mad. I kept avoiding it. I'm not a musician. I had no business. But yeah, I mean, he should, if he understands that you're not a musician, he should understand as a musician that that's not a good idea. Yeah, very strange. Musicians are weird, guys. Musicians are really weird. But I mean, some, I mean, but they are serious too. Most of the time. Wolf 10 says, word, applause for, for one of the things I said on my notes. Oops. Yeah. Oh, actually, that was 10.05, and I think I got done around 10.05 with my notes. So thank you. <laughs> Daniel Craig says, red pill time. 99% of women aren't worth the effort and don't appreciate or recognize any what any of what you would do. I guess, you know, you would have to... um. You'd already have to have a heart of gratefulness. You you are okay, okay. To to be fair, the prof kind of lucked out. I mean, I'm not tooting my horn, but I'm already a generally happy person. I he knows he knows my relatives know. I'm I'm pretty Spartan. I don't have a lot of stuff. I don't really need a lot of stuff. All I need is function. 
you know, to, to be happy in a home. If I have running water, a few dishes, my, my groceries to cook, you know, vegetable oil, a card table and a chair, a bookshelf for my music and my books. I need another bookshelf, but prof don't, don't take notes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, if, if, if I have a roof over my head, I'm, I'm pretty happy. So you have to be in a place of contentment. I think if I wasn't happy with myself or life, and I'm not saying this is a vain thing, I'm not saying this is a self-absorbed thing, but if I truly was not grateful, and great gratefulness takes practice, thankfulness, thankful, thankfulness takes practice. But if I was not in a place of contentment, I don't think I would be dating. Uh, because I think people, I, I mean, sound a graver romance advice. No, that's this is not a this is not a dating advice channel, but I, I'm just saying actually as an application, a life application, before you seek anything else, career, relationship, um, a, a new big decision, buying a house, whatever the case may be, a financial decision, moving to a different state, whatever the case may be, you have to, ha you have to be in a place of contentment. Or the next thing is going to be a really hard transition. So, yeah. Chivalry. That's right. Yeah, he's he's really a knight, actually. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty awesome. Samuel Proctor makes a good point. It is old fashioned, meaning it's worked for centuries. So now we got to talk about collaboration, guys. <laughs> We're going going off off the off the topic. In response to your advice on being romantic, next week, Sound Engraver, how to be a gentleman, the musical. Except I don't write musicals. That's another thing. If someone approached me saying, hey, could you write a musical for the story? I'm like, no, because I, I know nothing about musicals. I, I wouldn't know where to start with writing a musical. I found a unicorn with wise things to say about art collaboration to boot. <laughs> Right. <laughs> he is already looking up shelves on Amazon. Well, he no, he he isn't anymore. <laughs> he is not the ladies' man anymore. He only has one lady. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I know what you meant, Big Al. Uh, let's see. Sam Craig says, what you're describing is the opposite of what it must do. They try to date in order to feel content, which is not, which is not true. Like, I, which is true, but not right. Um, no, 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 no. Like, you, you just, oh. it, it, this is for any life application. You just, you're, you can't. Now, I love change. Like, I, I'm, I'm a person who's adapted to different things. I've lived in, I've lived in five different states. I've gone to two different schools. I've had different kinds of jobs over the 15 years. Oh, well, whoa. 18 years now. It's, it's 18 years since I've been 16. <laughs> um, I've had all, all these sorts of jobs and, and, and life transitions, so I'm fine with uh, adapting. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty adaptable. But you, call, you have to come from a place of just being... Um, uh, just, just focused and, and, and knowing how to prioritize. So no, people, people should not consider dating if they're not content with their current situation. All right. Enough about dating. Let's talk about art. Any questions? Any questions about collaboration? Wolf10 says, some people message me art-wise about collabs, collabs, collaborations, and I have to turn them down. I need to work on myself before I really can work with a team. That's a very good thing to realize. And, and we had talked about self-awareness. I was in no position to do that freelance job with that podcast radio personality over in Australia. He, okay, so I sort of lucked out with, with that one because 
I had produced music for him and he liked the music, but he wanted sound designs that I, I still have a hard time producing. And it's like those noise sweeps, um, you know, where, where there's this intro of a logo or an intro of a, a podcast audio that goes and has this big explosion. And then it's like this radio talk show host kind of voice and you've got the music and you've got the side chaining, what, 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 you know? And so I, I did the music. I didn't do any music with side chaining, although I probably could now. Um, but it was, he wanted sound effects. He didn't want my music. So he was really disappointed, but he's like, wait, did you compose that music? I said, yeah. He's like, oh, okay, well I'll take the music. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, but it was, I, I thought I had chops that I, I really didn't have. I was in no position to take on that collaboration and it, and it ended up being an embarrassing exchange. I, I, I it was not a feel good moment. So, oh, well. But yeah, yeah, know your skills first and then work with people who are of your same skill set. Now, there are entrepreneurs out there that say, you got to be around people who are better than you. You got people got to be around people who are so much smarter than you. Uh, that's all well and good to learn from and, and to you know seek out mentors and all that. But if you're in a serious collaboration, you, you really you want to be up in their you know stratosphere before you would ever consider something like a collaboration. And it's especially important because people in different fields don't know what to expect in music. I had another collaboration that ended in disaster. So I had, I, I composed in, in my call, oh, bringing back embarrassing memories. So when I was in Wisconsin as a graduate student, a film producer approached the, the composition department and he was a student film producer, a filmmaker, and he was good at what he did, but he needed, uh, he needed music for his documentary on the dangerous muscles poisoning Lake Michigan, dot, dot, dot. So he, he wanted some dark, he wanted some dark music for these terror, the, the terror of muscles invading Lake Michigan. So I, I did dark electronic. I did like, oh, so bad. I, I actually found all the files of these music pieces. And I'm like, I did that. I did that. And I gave it to him. Now, short story, long story short, he hated what I gave him. He had every right to hate what I what I gave him. And so I said, okay, I'm sorry, this is this didn't go well. And I I, dude, I I was crying in these music labs saying, I need to make this work. Uh, and I was so stressed out. Just so stressed out. I mean, I wasn't even paid and I was stressed out. And so fortunately, now I I totally lucked out on this one too. Fortunately, I was friends with um, with someone who is best friends with an Emmy award winning composer. He's won Emmys for his commercial music. And I said, Hey, Eric, cause he knew me too. He, he was a student. Um, I think he was a student a couple years before I was a student. I said, Hey, Eric, listen, um, I, I need your help. This guy is doing a documentary. Can you do this for me? It's not paid. I'm sorry, but could you do this for me? <laughs> And he was kind enough to do it. And he and he did fine. Like he did fine. The point of that that story though was the film producer. Okay, so here's here's where the film, not producer, maker, the filmmaker, here's where he fell short. He told me, this is this is a red flag, guys, for, for anyone to, considering doing a, any kind of collaboration. When someone like a filmmaker says, oh, go with your intuition. Like if he says to a composer, go with your intuition. You have more musical taste and sensibilities than I could ever. I know nothing about music. That is no excuse for the filmmaker not to be as specific as possible. He never said he didn't want electronic sounds. He never said he only wanted orchestra sounds. He never said he didn't want ambience. He never said he didn't want these kind of weird sound effects. I was trying to do it with my very, um, very basic skill levels back then. Um, but he was not specific. When you go into a project and someone says to you, oh, you know what to do. No, 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 no. 
no. If they're the boss, they you they have to dictate what you do for something like that. The filmmaker might not know the musical language. They might not know the musical terms and, and how to express things. But if they if, if they tell you something, you know, you as the composer, I'm just using the composer as an example. It could be any artist. You, you the composer, say, oh, are you looking for this or are you looking for this? And the that filmmaker cannot say, oh, whatever you want. And that happened. No, are you looking for this? Are you, or are you looking for this? Okay, I'm looking for this. Okay, now, what are you looking here? Are you looking for here? Uh, are you looking for this here or this this over here? I'm looking for this over here. That's another thing. You have to be specific. You have to be very, very, uh, there, there's, there's, uh, there, I would say you, be specific as possible because um, especially people who are beginning their careers or starting in their speciality, they think that composers who are already professionals will say, oh, well, you know what to do. Even Eric, who was an Emmy award winning composer, said, uh, no, you need to tell me what to do. What, what, what do you specifically want? And, and it made the filmmaker uh, uh, very uncomfortable, but he had to be specific or the project was not going to go well. He was specific. Eric gave him what he wanted and it was fine. And he was so happy. The filmmaker was so happy after that. He's like, oh, I should have asked him first. I'm like, well, yeah, you didn't know him. <laughs> he didn't say that. But but I remember that being an, a, also a, a very embarrassing uh, couple of weeks where he was like, what is this? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Big Al presents, who would be your dream collaboration? Um, let's see. That's it. That's a good, that's a good uh, question. Okay. So if it were, if it were electronic music, I actually sort of know this guy. I, I don't know if he'd ever ask me. I think he already has a violinist he uses. Um, Stefan Torto is a composer I really admire and respect. So if he ever wanted violin samples for his music, I would love to record for him. Um, and I feel like that could be possible because we, we sort of know each other, like at least following each other's YouTube channels. And I think that's it. Maybe, maybe Twitter from time to time. Uh, now for, for someone who probably I can never approach probably for another 10 to 15 years would probably be something, someone like Solar Fields, uh, who is just a master at electronic music. He's, he's at his own stratosphere. Uh, but, but collaborating with him now collaborating with composers like you I've okay I've been on other collaborations where um I, I did one recently last summer where it's fun but you don't get known so I, I was working with this guy he's 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 a great composer himself um who is he <laughs> I forgot who I was with because I've done a couple of these now for for different people his name is Audio Obscura, and he's based in the UK. He's, he's a nice enough guy. Uh, and he's great with mastering his own soundscapes and stuff. And I've done violin samples for him. And I've done um, I've done this 2020 project with, with him where he has a composer every 20 days for 2020. We did 20 20, 20 second tracks. So I, I composed 20 20 second tracks, which amounts to 6 minutes and 40 seconds. It was fun. And it sounded good and it challenged me, but it didn't go anywhere. And, and I'm not expecting that. I collaborated with, I've collaborated with two other electronic artists and I thought I was gonna, you know, be heard on a UK radio station, like for underground radio. This was a couple Aprils ago, nothing, nothing took off. And, and he's, he's a really good composer and mastering engineer. He works in a very nice studio. Um, I worked with another guy who, oh, him. Uh, he's a very good composer. I like, well, I, I wouldn't say very good, but I do like his music. And um, I think his label name is Time Rivals. And I like it. And I like his, I like his colors. I like his style. I like his mastering engineering. Um, if I was ever in a bind, maybe I would go to him. Maybe I'd go to Audio Obscura for mastering engineering if, if, if I needed to. But I, I do like uh, uh, Synth, Synth No Electro, who I'm with now. Um, where was I going with that? There was a collaboration where I gave, um, 
he he had some instruments. He had like a kind of a bass, not bass, but he had this like melodic ostinato. And then I filled in with percussion and um, also an ar arpeggiated synth. And and he liked it just fine. But I I remember his output, the way he outputted my percussion, the reverb was everywhere. And it just like washed out. Like it just bounced around my head. Like I was like, what'd you do to my percussion? And so my, my, I and I remember spending hours getting that percussion really clean and really tight and 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 have a really very specific envelope and and you know a very specific attack a decay and a release. I mean, I was really like, I'm like a house cleaner, like I'm a housekeeper for sound. I I try to make it as clean and tidy as possible. And it was nothing against him, but he really, when you it's called um, I forgot what the album was called. But it's called, if you go on Spotify, it's called Rainbow Snakes. And so I did the percussion and the and the synth for his his uh, synth ostinato. It was like this kind of... And so he's like, Here, here's this little line that I made up. And then I just did percussion and I did a synth. I can't remember how many synths I, I gave him. And it was fine. It was cute. I think his son was three at the time and he thought up of rainbow snakes. He's like, this is what we're calling our um, album uh, or track. Real, I got to cough for a second. But anyway, um, what was I going to say? So but it was fine. It was, it was cute. But like hit the, the, the way he made my my perk was percussion was just totally washed out. It just wasn't the same. And he liked it. And it was for his album. So I'm not going to I'm not going to say anything. So I've been on some collaborations. I've been on. Um, actually, I didn't even realize when I did this topic, I've been on radio station collaboration, Time Rivals. Um, oh, someone else. Oh, okay. So he did it for the radio station and then a, a, an album he compiled for Spotify. So a couple of those collaborations. I've been on one other. And collaborations, uh, excuse me, I know this is uh, from Al's question, who would you collaborate? What's your dream collaboration? So we'll get back to that. But collaborations with other composers, even composers uh, who are a little bit better than you or more competent in their post-production, uh, all that good stuff. I, I'm starting to not, and, and I don't mean this against any, any artists I know, but you know, unless they have a lot of acumen and a lot of prolific output, I'm not really inclined to collaborate with uh, composers anymore or artists anymore because this may sound a little selfish, but I'm really about marketing my own name. Now people say, well, no, you, you never, they're, they're going to be recognized by other listeners. I, I know, I know. Like, oh, okay, who's Sound Engraver? Okay, she's this person. Um, I'll, I'll check her stuff out here. I understand that. But the collaborations I've done so far take a lot of time and there's not a lot of fruit. Um, it's great to, to work with independent artists, but I, I've also noticed artists who are independent. I've, I've noticed independent artists who are very serious about marketing their style and their music. And I know independent artists who are good, who are really good, but don't really have an interest in marketing their music. They, they, they put it up on Bandcamp, but they, they don't, they don't do anything else. They don't, they don't have their own YouTube channel. They don't have their own blog. They don't have their own podcast. They don't have their own website to showcase their stuff it's just like oh let's just put an album on Bandcamp. and if you're a serious artist that's one place to go but you you really do have to market yourself constantly daily to get your get your music out there so someone like solar fields or stefan torto like he's oh man stefan is really serious about his craft he is so awesome like what he does for his media with his um analog sense and, and controllers I would love to do with super collider or I'd love to do with um, digital you know software but if he said oh yeah I'd, I'd like some violin sounds oh yeah oh yeah I would and and yeah that sounds kind of sounds wrong but I, I would almost like do it for free um, 
because I, I have that much respect for that artist, uh, for, for Stefan Torto and definitely for Solar Fields. That would be fun. Now, I can't really sell, sell myself too short. It is such a project. And when you do collaboration, especially when you get to a skill like I'm at at the violin, I really do have to charge people because it's just recording violin and getting that clean sound just right takes so long. It is a very, very much a painstaking process. And even for people I respect, I'm like, hey, could I have like this flat rate fee or something? Because because I, I am a professional violinist. I mean, I, I, I charge for weddings. I, I would charge for shows, you know, so, but we'll see. But yeah, art, I mean, but someone like Stefan Torto or um, Solar Fields, they have a huge following. I mean, they have a huge following, especially Solar Fields. So if my name appeared on a Sol Solar Fields album, oh my goodness, that would be my fee. That would that'd be like, oh, that's awesome. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you you got to know what to charge. As, as a professional, you have to know and you have to be comfortable saying, hey, I've charged this rate. I charge this amount for this much music or this much recording time. And, and that's just, that's just being a professional, especially if you're a master on your instrument or your voice. Now, um, Big Al also, let's, let's bring up that, that uh, comment again. That was, that was a huge tangent, but uh, I like, I like tangents, especially if the chat is slow. Um, um, who would be your dream collaboration as a violinist? Uh, I, I would say I would love, love, love to collaborate with Jordan Rudis, who's the keyboardist of Dream Theater. I mean, it'd be fun to do like play with Dream Theater anyway. Um, but as far as like music, musicianship and, and his his musical prowess, but not just his musical prowess, his his composition technique and his harmonies and his and his bass and his melody and, and his musical creativity as a composer. I mean, he's a genius at, at the keyboard, but his musical genius as a composer. Oh my goodness, doing a collaboration with Jordan Rudis with keys and not just like piano. I I would love to do. You know, my my favorite thing in the world would be something like him on his his synths and his and, and his pads and his software and all that expensive stuff he works with with Dream Theater Theater. And then then I would um I would do acoustic violin, of course, but then I would do something like live signal processing. I would like try to develop these really beautiful sounds and but I'm nowhere near the violin shops as he is on keyboard. So that would be probably an impossibility, but yeah, he, he would be so fun to play with. Like I would, I would have such a ball rehearsing with him, but there, I could just only imagine like, you know, being in a room with him and then he'd get frustrated because I, I, I just don't, I, I don't shred the violin. Like he shreds the, the, the keyboard, the piano. So Well, Nitter, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put that publicly, but I don't know. <laughs> you know, we're making plans to go to Virginia, or I'm going, you know, we're making plans for me to go to Virginia. So, but you know, I mean, nothing set in stone, but yeah. <laughs> mm. Professor Geek says, one difficult factor in the art realm is that you might be a higher caliber writer or artist, but you can only afford or be afforded by a lesser caliber writer or artist. So uh, what do you mean? Are, let's see. Are you saying that you would be doing work for a fee that is less than what you would normally charge. Is that what you're saying? But you can only afford or be afforded by a lesser caliber writer or artist. So in the sense of collaboration. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy. You know, I'm not saying that it's easy to find people who are at the same level of skill in their craft and, and their speciality as you are in yours. That That is hard. Um, recently, uh, David Stewart had 
two artists on his Saturday stream, um, Jesse White, would, who is a who is an illustrator and a, and a darn good one at that. And then um, John De La Rosa, who is a writer. He's a prolific science fiction fantasy writer. And the two got together. I think they were mutual friends of David and the, the two got together and they, they produced um, a new fantasy graphic novel, I think it was. Uh, I think it's called Deus Vault, but uh, I, I would say I, I want to like it myself. But as a Christian, I, I saw some I saw some in, images that I'm like, okay, that that's 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 for guys. <laughs> um, but it's it's they had the same vision, they had the same professional mindset and the same vision, and and John De La Rosa was um, I think I'm saying his name right, De, John De La Rose, I think. Rosa or Rose, I can't remember. He's he's as good a writer as Jesse White is as good as a, a, a visual artist and illustrator. Um, fascinating stuff. If you go on Jesse White's twi uh, Twitter, it's his art is really good. He does like the classic style, and then they have a colorist who was also professionally minded. And so when you have a collaboration like three or four people with the same the same acumen and the same level of profession, the same level of experience in their craft and the same mindset. That's, that's pretty cool. That That's, that's really cool. That'd be really, really fun to, um, to be a part of. So I hope, Prof, I hope I, I'm understanding your, your comment correctly. Uh, Samuel Proctor says a lot of comic artists, writers, editors um, throughout history could have used this advice. Ego is a reoccurring theme. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If if artists struggle with one thing, it is ego. And and what what mitigates ego or what what completely prevents ego? I think um, self-awareness. So. You know, it it kind of it, it did kind of cut me when when that Australian podcast host or, or talk show personality, he said, you, you're, you're not up to speed. You're not up to par. I'm kind of, he, he was disappointed. He told me he was disappointed. It hurt. Oh, oh, it hurt. Um, but, but he was right, you know, and, and I was humbled. I, I was not against him. I was not forward with him. I, I, I said, wow, you're right. You know, and you can't have ego. You know, and one way not to have an unhealthy ego is to understand where you are in your skill. So, you know, I'm not going to say just because I have made two music albums and I plan on doing a few of them this year, hopefully, if all goes well. I'm not going to say, well, because I can do that, I could do like a, an A-list game. Okay, where, where are the game developers? I need to, I need to, I need to compose for these great award-winning games. I was like, I've never composed for games before. If anything, like the developer could contact me for a couple things, like a world, like a setting, like maybe it's like a, a, a setting with a fountain and, and, and like a, a rock garden or something like that. Or maybe it's like a, on a bridge or something high above in the air. Sure. Maybe two settings out of like 18 or 20. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. I can get the experience and then I can build my professional demo and portfolio and all that good stuff. But as far as I probably should do that just for fun later, later, like a couple of years down the road, just, you know, make up, you know, find my favorite games and just compose music in the background for those games. I think actually I should do that. I, I would like to try my hand in independent games. Um, it depends on the story, but I've been really impressed with animation of recent indie games. It's just sparked kind of an imagination like, oh, maybe I would like to compose that, those kind of games. But I'm in no way to say, give me my my video game contract. Give, give me my give me my due because because I could because I could make albums. No, I mean, making an album of original music is very, very different. It's a very different experience and it takes a very different level of skills and assessment to doing that as as uh, you know, versus doing a game for someone else, you know, a game where music comes second. Music is so important, but music is second to the gameplay, to the visual experience of the gameplay and also the story. 
it enhances the gameplay. It enhances the story, but it is second. And I, and I say that confidently because if you, if as a composer, if you believe it's second to the gameplay experience, it's going to better the gameplay experience. I, I just, I just believe that from my heart. But yeah, ego, that's another, that's another thing with art, artistic collaboration is you, you do see a lot of ego. You see a lot of unwanted, unwarranted ego in, in the artistic circles. So you, what counters that is just being professional and being responsible. I think that's the best. Yeah, I, I do met, I did catch that you did say throughout. Oh, it jumped down again, man. <laughs> I was on my way to a comment that Wolf10 said. Let's see if I can find it. What was it? I think it was like um, 10, 13 or something. I know it was a Wolf10 comment at 10. There it is. Sound good. Recently, someone asked me about doing tutorials about drawing fit bodies. Since I do a lot of fit bodies now, off topic. Well, it's not off topic. I mean, I think like tutorials, like in, in video format, I think that'd be really important. Yeah, get 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 you some good lighting and 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 a microphone and and take it away. Start start doing that on your channels. I think, by the way, I think your channel would really grow if you if you just did drawing tutorials. Like this is how you do a face. This is how you do a hand. This is how you do a body. I think. Oh man, I think you'd get a lot of views. You know, I mean, my, I, I'm so proud of the growth of my channel, but my, my topic is really niche. I do super clutter and electronic music. I mean, with Logic Pro, that's pretty niche. You know, not everyone wants to learn how to compose electronic music. Not everyone listens to electronic music, but people would really want to draw human anatomy. I, I think people would like, oh yeah, how do you how do you make the arm look like that? How do you make the hand look like that? Oh, I think I think your videos, if, if you did videos like that, it would you would get so many subscribers really quite quickly because that's that's something people are very much interested in doing and learning. Oh, you've you've continued. I think I've taken several steps more in my art journey. Now writing. I need to get out of my block on writing my comments comics yep 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 good oh let's i'm trying to slowly there he is i only say uh you know what to do to people who have worked with me a long time and knows the work by heart never someone new to the work yeah i would say oh yeah like it if they knew yeah if someone said to you, you know what to do, they would have to know really who you are as an artist, how you work, how long you spend time on something, your style, your artistic sensibilities, all that stuff. Meaning you'd really have to have worked with them for months, if not years. They would have to, you have to earn a level of trust. Like they, they already, they're, they're already placing their trust on you. I don't like the idea, and this is true for just trust in general. I don't like people entitled to trust. So this this means, you know, even I could I could like you, I could love you, I don't have to trust you. Like you have to earn my trust. Okay, it's okay. Like you're not a bad person. I don't think ill of you, but you have you have to earn my trust. People are entitled. Like I'm your relative. You should trust me. I'm like no no no. I love you. I love you, but I don't trust you. <laughs> It's the same, the same is true for in the case with this filmmaker, where he's like, he, he was giving me his trust. I didn't earn his trust, not from the start. And that's why he was so disappointed. I bet that was one reason why he was so disappointed. He, he thought he could just give me his trust. And he's like, you know what to do. You're, you're, you're a student, you're a composition student. See, that's, that was his first mistake. You, you go to a composition department in a liberal arts university to get a student who thinks like you think, you think. A, a student composer knows how to compose for film. Maybe someone from Berkeley, but that's it. Or maybe someone from the UK, but in America, no. Unless that person's in Berkeley or UT, UT Tech, uh, University of Texas, 
and some film school in California where, where they teach only film scoring. No, um, but even, even specifically film composer schools, no. No, they could, they could be good, but chances are, if they're just starting, they have absolutely no idea what to do. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right, Wolf 10. That, that, that's, that's a good way to um, say it. Thank you for clarifying that the person who says, ah, you know what to do, would have to have known you and your artistic merit for a long time. See, sound, whoa, Sound Engraver has the superpower of turning her voice into digital sound naturally. Did something happen with the audio or something? What do you mean by that? Has the superpower of turning her voice into digital sound naturally. Yeah. Yeah, actually, well, if you, okay, so, yeah, I do. Because when my voice goes into the microphone, it, it becomes digital information. And then when it comes out of your computer device, it becomes electrical signals, which goes into, I believe, analog, analog information. So, yes, you hear my, you hear uh, uh, two major steps happening, happening at the same time. My voice, which is, I'm hearing it as analog, goes into the microphone, becomes digital you know, digital audio converter, and it comes out of the speakers and then into your ears and brain and you perceive it and it's analog information. I mean, it's electrical impulses, but I have no idea what you're talking about, Samuel Proctor. <laughs> Melissa Harris has to make the sad point that it's a sad, um, it's sad art becomes lost in media like film, films, music and more, um, you know, to quote, to quote Troy, by the physical media before it becomes lost media. Yeah, I bet like physical media is going to become future treasure troves. It's like, what is this? Um, Matthew says, I guess my Sunday morning streams with Troy are a type of collaboration. I would say so. I mean, if, if you guys have the same objective. So I, I love stream. I love streaming, for instance. But um, you know, as far as my YouTube channel, the the bread and butter really are my super glider videos. So it's like I love I love streaming as far as the community and, and people outside the community um, know, know who I am as an artist. You know, because I talk and stuff like that. But there, you know, there's 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 definitely um, you know fruition. You know, you 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 know when I'm when I'm with the prof, you know having done his rewatches, a few of his rewatches, and, you know, we'll do some commentary, uh, you know, on things like Chronicles of Narnia and Lord of the Rings and, and different things like that. Well, that that's that's edifying and, and that is ed educational. But he and I have the kind of this the same intellectual mindset where, where we, what we speak on our streams, uh, we, we intend it to be informative, educational, insightful, helpful. And, and all of that. So that's, that's our objective. We have a mutual objective there. So yeah, if you're, if the objective is, is, is the same, yes, it would be, um, it would be a collaboration. Humble <laughs> tenses. I love dream theater. I mean, it's, 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 it's good music. There's just no going about that. Dr. Y says, tales old, tales old as time, beauty and the geek. That's funny. That's cute. That's cute. And I think Netter is, a, is, is agreeing with that. <laughs> Wolf 10 says, looks at Wolf 10, uh, Wolf 10's artwork, the Wolf Commander knows his demographic well. You know, um, so like I, I, I do like the story. I, I know a little bit of Final Fantasy VII. You know, we, we were watching Green Lion Girl stream. And um, so you, you had posted that art. You know, I'm not like I'm not, you, you know me, man. I'm like I, I'm not really into the furry stuff. But, you know, you, you wrote you, you, you drew Zach as a wolf and Eris as a um, 
Well, I, now I saw the goat. You, I thought she was like a fox or a wolf, but then, then I saw the tail and I saw the horns and stuff like that. I was like, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. That that actually that that that's kind of like well, that's actually more anthropomorphic. So maybe I should I should stamp a like on that art because <laughs> that is anthropomorphic. That's that's not furry. That's that's just my opinion. We don't. You you, you could have your discussion on your stream about that. <laughs> But that's that's the opinion of the sound engraver stream. <laughs> um, let's see. Wolf Tan also says, sound engraver, when you really think about it, technically we're practicing collaboration with these streams. I, I would say so. Um, I, I I think everyone has in our community may or may not have a different objective. So, you know, for instance, my stream, I love talking to you guys and I love sharing my thoughts and my opinions. But at the end of the day, I I, I want to market myself as an artist and I want to market my brand as, as Sound Engraver. You know, that is my artist name. That's just that's not just my YouTube channel name. That, that is my artist name. And so, you know, it's, it's a way for people outside the community to get to know me. So I, I do have an objective that is for community, but it is also for the professional. Like I, I really... I think it would just be awesome. It, uh, I don't need a lot of money. It'd just be awesome to, to, to even make a few hundred dollars a month on my music. And I, and I believe that's achievable. I believe that's possible, but that, that's, that would just be so cool. And what do I do? I just keep streaming. I just keep producing content every Thursday and, and maybe a Saturday every once in a while. And, and also streaming live on Mondays all the while building my website and, being prolific with my albums and, and selling my albums and my electronic music and all that good stuff. Now, some people have that artistic business mindset as well in the community. Um, I think a lot of people, I get, I do get the vibe that a lot of people, I could be wrong, but I, I do get the vibe that people, most people in the community who do stream just want to hang out, which is fine. If, I mean, I will say Sound engravers got to be honest. Um, if you really do want to build your business or at least your presence online, you've, you've got to put out content. And, and content is not streaming. Streaming is fun. Streaming is relaxing. It's engaging. It's hanging out with people. It's fun and it gets you a few views. But the thing, the thing that's going to get you the views is, is the commentary, like the fixed commentary every week. That's, that's what's going to get you the views. That's what's going to get you the um, subscribers. And also, it has to be following your niche. So my my streaming, my, my Monday Night Streams really broaden the, the topic of art in general, whether it's business, advice, or, you know, philosophy, artistic philosophy, or art, the philosophy of art, popular art commentary, you know, like with our geek news and stuff. So it is a little bit, it's, it's broadened out just a little bit uh, because that's, that's just, that's just what I enjoy. I, that's not, that's not a strategy. I just enjoy talking about the, the bigger picture more than, you know, some people have asked me, Oh, why don't you stream super collider live? I'm like, I'm not coding live in front of people. <laughs> I love super collider, but that's, that's a personal private thing between me and super collider. I'm not going to, I am not at that level. I'm not like Eli field steel where he can, you know, put out some live code and, and he can troubleshoot. Like he can lecture on Super Collider Live and there could be something that goes wrong a couple of times. He's like, what in the world? And then he's like this. And you know, he'll find the error in two minutes. Sometimes I find the error in not, two, in, uh, he's, he's less, in two seconds. Sometimes I'll find the error in less than two seconds, but there's no way I can do live coding uh, in, in front of people. I would I would freeze up if, if something happened to my code or, or even worse, actually, I'm not even so much afraid of getting errors. I'm, I'm more afraid of um, sound exploding, like something goes horribly wrong. And then the listener's ears just go, what was that? And, and I, I know how to kill it quickly. I know how to kill the sound quickly, but I would just be mortified if I hurt the ears of my listeners, especially my ears too, you know? But anyway, uh, so... The streaming is just going to be more you know, a, a broad topic of art. You know, it's just more of an umbrella of art in general. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, but yes. Um, if your objective about getting 
the subscribers and the views, you have to, you really have to do fixed videos of your niche. So with Wolf 10, sketching anatomy, man, that would be a, that's a niche. That, that's, a, and, but it's not just niche in, in an exclusive way. That's a popular topic. That's what people would be turning to. Like if you were a dance instructor and you, you knew, you knew how to do hip hop art and you could film yourself in your own bedroom, that's really popular. My, my experimental electronic music isn't as popular and that's fine. I don't, I don't want to be popular if, if it means doing something outside what I love. I, I, I would love Super Collider to be popular. Actually, it's my most popular content, but I understand it's totally niche. I, I totally, I, I get that it's not for everyone. Dr. Y says, I'm going to stay single as long as possible. And then he then he concludes it with, unless God has other plans. I, I thought I was going to be single until like 50. <laughs> I was actually, I was very comfortable. I, oh, I just loved it. I loved it. Um, but I, I, I just can't imagine my days and my, my life without the prop anymore. It's just, he, he did this to me. <laughs> He, he's just like, he, he has made it so enjoyable where it's like, why would I want to go back? <clears throat> Daniel Craig says, talk about professionalism. Hollow Notes absolutely loathe each other and don't inter interact at all, but they still tour and perform on stage together. I, yeah, I, that's, that's a whole new level of professionalism. I, I mean, oh my, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a famous, um, if you guys know anything about I Love Lucy, Lucille Ball and Dizzy Arnaz, there, there's a famous, uh, it, it's really sad, unfortunately, but, there's a there's a, a famous feud between William Frawley and Vivian Vance. They they hated each other in real life. That is so sad to me. So so Fred and Ethel Mertz in real life, they they did not like each other. They just couldn't stand each other. But wow, wow, back then that they were so professional because yeah, they 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 portrayed a couple that was kind of like, you know, they 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 had they ruffled some feathers. They they were um they were sort of um, playing off of an unhappy married couple, but they still sort of loved each other. Um, but they were still comic relief to, you know, the uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz couple, you know, Lucy and Ricky. And, and you would never even know. Watching those episodes, you would never even know that William Frawley and Vivian Vance actually had a real life feud where they couldn't stand each other. And that was a long time of acting together and 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 season after season that's really sad i that that kind of stuff always makes me sad but wow what a level of professionalism to actually be acting or touring with people that you just couldn't get along with you know behind the stage or in real life it's crazy crazy Well, 10 says, working on it. Definitely will be doing some art related stuff. Just need to make sure no one in house in the house interrupts. Yeah, I do have an advantage of, of um, my living situation where it's pretty controlled. I mean, my my walls are paper thin. Usually when I record, it's Wednesday night when people are more or less quiet, where there's no activity going outside. Yeah. Samuel Proctor says, Mark Rilly is extremely successful at making how to, how to draw videos. That's good. Oh, you think so, Gabriel. Now, are you a composer or do you do Super Collider or how do you know me? Or are you from the prof community, the Professor Geek community? I think more artists experiment with electronica, uh, that genre than not. I do like electronica. Um, if that's a... I think of electronica almost like I think of house. It has been a while since I've actually, well, no, it's, okay. So electronica 
I, I get the idea that it's a very, very broad genre name where um, oh, I forgot which streaming platform I'm on where I'm under the genre electronica, even though it's not really electronica. It's more, I don't know what you'd call it. Eclectic, experimental. I don't, I don't know what you would call it, but I guess you're right. I guess you're right. Now more people, because of feel, um, um, Eli Field Steel's channel, more people are into Super Collider or they're getting into Super Collider or they're getting into things like Sonic Pi and live coding. I don't think I'll ever live code. I don't see, for me at least, I don't, as a composer, I don't see the point of live coding. Live coding to be just, just, just as an opinion, just as an opinion, it's cool. I don't mind it. But live coding to me as a musician, kind of looks like shoegazing. And if you don't know what shoegazing is, it's it's essentially, as the name implies, I think it's a British term, but it's it's a genre now where it's it's a lot of these rock artists, experimental artists, and, you know, folk artists. They, they, they do all these knobs and, uh, you know, pads and pedals and, and all of that. They've got all this equipment, this whole palette of, of things, you know, gear to, to touch and press with their feet. And they're just always looking at their shoes. And I, I'm, I'm a musician where I just love seeing a musician just kind of like they have all that gear, but they look out into the audience or they're, they're, they're into their uh, instrument. You know, they're, they're into the group, they're into the setting and it's not just looking down and live coding gives me that impression. Like it's, 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 it's shoegazing for, um, for, for, for computer music. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, I see a point to it, but I, I don't think I'll ever explore it myself. So uh, Dr. Y says, I've been drawing and animating as a hobby for well over a decade. I still, uh, I, I still have no idea what I'm doing, but I do it anyway. I don't know, man. I think you do. I think you do know what you're doing. Um, I, by the way, keep, I mean, if it's not too much trouble, I hope, I hope you would get views. I, I promise you, man, if you do what, what you've done, the, you've done a couple of these now, and, and I should check if you've done more, but you've done the sketch and then you've put it on the, I think Adobe software. I think it's Adobe and you, you, you do commentary over it. You, and by the way, you have relaxing music. Like your, your music is relaxing. It's almost ASMR. I know that sounds, I, I'm not saying that to sound silly, but it is very engaging and enjoyable to watch you sketch something while talking, while, while talking so, about something historical. Like you were doing this like mythological creature, but like a, a cross between a dragon and a jackal. And you were talking about the history, the, the historical context of it while sketching it and then putting it to the software to color it. And then you had some interesting music in the background. I mean, that, that's, that's, those videos, I'm sure people would want. I hope, I hope you continue doing those videos because that's, that's pretty cool stuff. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. It looks like you're, you know what you're doing. You're, um, you're a very good concept artist. Like if, if I could say that, I, I, if, I'm not an artist visual. I'm not a visual artist. So I don't know if that, that would be a term that's appropriate for what I mean, but you just, you just seem to know, like you, you have a concept of something and then you sketch it and then you color it. It's really cool. So I don't know, man, I think you could be a really good concept artist. I don't I have no idea what you're saying, Wolfton. I could be wrong, but I think he, Samuel, was talking about that beat you were imitating and you having a Reed Richards moment there. I'm probably having a Reed Richards moment right now. Oh, yeah. Like when I was doing the side chaining. Whoop. You know, like, so, so side chaining is pretty cool. It's a pretty cool technique where, um, if you ever listen to electronica or or house or or something, I don't really listen to house. I, I'm not really into the kind of the party electronic music. I I understand it. I understand its place. I, I love uplifting trance. That's one of my favorite genres. Um, but uh, you'll you'll hear a synth, and 
rather than having it static like zzz, like that, you'll hear a side chain zzz, 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 and it can be really hard like that. That's a hard side chain, or it could be kind of like like quite soft. Um, depends on the threshold you give it. Um, it. It's a it's 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 taking a signal. It's taking that audio. Uh, but pr um, providing a, a, another signal, another audio signal signal for its control. So when you hear, um, let me say, let me say that right. I, I'm a little sleepy. I hope I, I hope I'm educating you correctly. So you take the audio, the synth, like that, and then you apply a controller to that synth. That is another signal, and it's usually an audio signal. In fact, I think it's only an audio signal. So like a kick drum like that, a nice heart attack, and then a, a, a nice short decay and release. Well, um, oh, that's probably not a, oh, I feel like I'm getting this backwards. But anyway, you, you get the idea. So the kick, the kick is the signal that controls the synth. Kick, duh, 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 like that. And so depending on your threshold you give it, if you give it a really good beefy threshold, right on that attack, um, it's at its quietest. The synth is at its quietest, and then it goes up when when the kick decays. I think that's how it works. I might be getting that backwards now that I think about it, but I'll, I'm tired. I, I'd have to see. I did. I think I did a video on side chaining, or at least a noise gate. I should. I should do a side chaining video. I really should actually, because now I know how to do this kind of music for for radio, like. Uh, WCR, like that, you know, it's fine. I, I feel a little loony right now. Oh, thank you. I meant when you mimicked your music earlier, it actually sounded like digital synth music, not like a glitch in the stream though. Interesting, that's cool. I have the ability, like, I've had this ability as a kid to do impressions, like sonic impressions, excuse me, or voice impressions. Now I'm not like Mark Hamill, like where he could do all these crazy different impressions. Um, but I've always had the ability to um, mimic some some person. It could, the person could have an accent. And, and it's not to say I know how to do accents. I, I just, I'm like a parrot. Like when I hear someone say something, um, I will, um, I will also, I'll internalize that. And, and then if it's asked, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll say it in, in the way the person said it. It kind of bites me back though, uh, socially, because it makes it makes a very awkward social experience when um, like, let's say, let's say I have a student who has a, a mother with a really thick foreign accent. And when I start explaining stuff to her mother, the thick foreign accent, I start imitating the thick foreign accent myself. And I don't know why I don't mean to, I just, I, I hear and I internalize it and it goes, Oh, hold that back. <laughs> you know, so. Oh no, I'm going to be educated on my own channel. There is a difference between anthro and furry. A big difference. All furries are anthros, but not, but not all anthros are furries. What? <laughs> well, I won't comment that then. I, I won't. I won't say anything. I won't comment. Uh, but thank you. See, I'm I'm not the animator, so what do I know? They are my anthro. What is OCS? What does that mean? As Final Fantasy characters. Not really random selected. As I did a stream about furry community, I know my work is not for everyone, but you guys love me. Yeah, you're great. I did like that picture. Yeah, I, I thought that was pretty cool. Very interesting choice to make Eris a goat. But she's so cute. Yeah, I really like... Um, now I, I, I do like Tifa as a character. But, like... Eris has just this um, really nice feminine side. It's not, it's not to say Tifa isn't feminine either. It's just, 
I, I think it's because she's wearing that red, that really beautiful red top over a really beautiful pink dress. And I just like the look of it. It's it's very much a feminine look that attracts me. And people who say like red and pink don't go together. It's like, yeah, they do. <laughs> I, I mean, I think they do anyway. Especially if you have brown hair. I don't think it would work with black hair. Could work with blonde hair. Um... Gabriel Krebs says, I've been scoring corporate spots and documentary shorts recently with zero experience. And my biggest takeaway so far is to be very afraid of scoring any drama work. You, uh, you can't fake drama chops. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, that's cool. Documentary shorts. That's cool. And and corporate spots. Are you talking about like, um? so what do you mean by corporate spots? Do you mean, do you, do you mean commercials or, or short clips like 15 second? jingles or or all that that's cool now i depending on the company i mean if it's a cool company and they have a cool business i would i, I wouldn't mind composing music for that business but don't ever give up or be afraid to, uh, but don't ever give up or be afraid to try things you might not be familiar with it really is who you know and what you uh, and not what you know i think so too so uh, I, I, let me clarify so i i did say yeah i'm i'm comfortable with the idea of doing gaming music or commercial music i'm not comfortable with setting a score to an orchestra that's not to say i would never try it that's not to say i would never try it but oh my goodness i know how much i would have to learn i know how much more time it would take for me to do an orchestral score to an electronic score. So if someone told me, hey, we, we we have this project, we have this film that we want you to do or this game we want you to do, but we've got a deadline deadline for you. We need we need to have your music out in three months. You know, let's say it's a game, a piece of game music, and and they say, okay, we need how many? Let's see. Um, I'm gonna guess. I'm going to guess they would probably need between this is this is a total guess, by the way. I, I don't know the situation. I'm going to guess between four to six hours of musical content for the game. Four to six hours. OK, that's that's a lot, guys. That's that's a lot of music. Four to six hours. I think I wait way too much. OK, let's let's say let's say two to three hours. Let's, let's, let's cap it off there. Two to three hours. Now, I can that would really push me. I'd, I'd be having all-nighters that would really, really push me to get music out there. Let's say they have a mastering engineer to take care of all of that. I would give them sketches. I would give them complete pieces. I would give them samples. I would give them all sorts of stuff. I would give them the whole enchilada, you know, two to three hours worth of music, two to three hours worth of electronic music. I That would so push me to, to, the, end of my, to the end of the wire on electronic music. But if they told me, say, no, we, we want this to be orchestral music. Uh, now, for me, it'd just be absolutely impossible to get an orchestra together and, and record. No way. I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I couldn't do that kind of labor. I just know myself where I, I would not be able to know how to do that. But even if I had a sample of library instruments that were tailored to sound like the orchestra, let, let's say it's, um, Spitfire audio with their orchestral libraries. Um, not even that, not even that because orchestra takes a different kind of orchestration. It takes a different kind of skill, uh, a um, different kind of set of skills to orchestrate with an orchestra than to orchestrate with electronic music. And I'm more familiar with electronic music. So that that's what I mean to say. Now, let's let's say they have a game in mind and they want Let's say they want 90 minutes worth of orchestra music and they don't need it until six months from now. I think I could do that. I think I could challenge myself to do that, especially especially if I knew the world and the story and what, what kind of tone they were wanting. Um, for something like Marvel, like, you know, that big epic orchestral Marvel music, like with Captain America and Thor and, and Iron Man? Probably not. I probably don't have the chops to do even that. But if it's more experimental for the world building, maybe it's like a, a fantasy or maybe it's science fiction and it's it's got beautiful melodic lines and beautiful 
primitive percussion kits or something like that. Yeah, I could do that. I, I definitely could do that. Wolfton says, I have a working with lemons situation until I can move and set up a better, uh, have a better se setup in space. Yeah, actually, that that's me too, man. That's absolutely me too. Yeah. You're, but you know, yeah, working with lemons. So th this room is my lemons. My, my living room is the boomiest, boomiest space I've ever lived in. Because my, my ceiling, I'm on the ground floor, but my ceilings are like nine feet above. And then it's all sheetrock and it's all hardwood floor and it's all cabinets. And so the, so if you, so my room is really controlled with all this black acoustic foam in front of me and behind me and, you know, off to the side and my carpet and, and the thick blankets, the, the, the thick blankets on my bed. Um, so I have somewhat of controlled space a little bit, but I can still hear like, they, I don't know why they decided to design this. I, I live in a, 550 square foot apartment. Okay. 550. All right. And on my, on my bedroom, I've got this whole glass door leading to the patio. And then my living room, which is right in front of me has a whole glass door leading to the patio. So it's like two giant walls of glass door. I, I will, I wish this was a whole wall and it would be all acoustic foam. That would be the best. So when I hear people talk outside, I, I hear every word they say. <laughs> it's like, oh. So yes, I'm working with lemons too. Scooter Tuna says, listening to everyone on this channel, Professor Geek, Troy, you encourages me to try. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I hope it, I hope it's insightful. I hope it helps. Everyone's different, you know? You're not going to, you're not going to sound like me. You're not going to sound like the prof. You're not going to sound like Troy and um, Big Al and Fan Man and all that. Um, you're, and, and Netter. Netter has her own voice. Um, so just, you know, just be yourself. I would just say be yourself. Um, actually, someone I, I really enjoy listening to, you're, you're funny. Actually, a couple of you guys are funny. Dr. Y, when you talk and, and sometimes you say things, you, you just make me laugh on your commentary. You just make me laugh. Um, uh, Horizon Talker, I, I haven't, I haven't picked up on your, um, newer underground art commentary, but, uh, I, I saw a little bit of your first one with your reviews of different, different things, which I think by the way is a cool topic, but you, you haven't, you're having this pipe and then you pretend to cough unless that's, a, unless that's a real thing. And then you just kept it in the, in the edit. I thought that was hilarious. That, that was the first thing I. I saw and I laughed at. So um, you guys have your own different quirks and personalities and I have my own, you know, Twitch. Um, so yeah. So don't ever feel like you have to sound like the professor or Big Al or, you know, Horizon Talker or me, you know, just do your, do your thing. Green Line Girl is in the house. Wolf 10 and I will be discussing the new Final Fantasy VII announcements on Wednesday at 6 p.m. ahead of my usual stream. SE released some interesting stuff last week. Wait, I did? Or, or someone else. <laughs> uh, I released a video on perfectionism, which was actually, by the way, just a, a condensed version of my stream. I'll be, I'll, I'll be posting those every week. I, I posted some FM synthesis. I'll probably be doing more FM synthesis uh, this week. But cool. Yeah, awesome. That is cool emoji because my prof is cool. Oh, I'm getting low on water, guys. I already started with low water, though. Okay, I, I had heard about this. I, I don't know why I feel like that's different, but maybe that's just an impression I had. So electronic is essentially all electronic music. Okay. Well, then I'm, a, I'm an electronica artist. 
I might have to step away to get some more water if you guys don't mind because I'm I am getting quite parched but uh, if you guys are cool, don't mind hanging out or I'll catch up with the chat and we can wrap it up I, I probably will start stop around the two two hour mark or, or a little bit after Wolf 10 says reworking reference sheets for characters while posting sketch work to keep people interested on their toes while on what I create and curious. That's, that's how you do it. That is how you do it. Oh, sound great. Uh, Wolf 10 says, oh, about family too. I love them, but I do not trust them. Probably explains why I'm so distant towards them. Oops, that was depressing. I mean, yeah, I, I know that's kind of a hard truth that that's a hard truth to take in but people are really like I, maybe it's part of our culture but but people are they, they expect you to trust them or they they expect to give their trust to you it's like wait why, why are you why are you putting that on me so like if someone is giving you a responsibility that you're not comfortable with and they say well i trust you i'm like don't trust me like, especially if you don't even know them. It's just weird. I mean, and it's, yeah. So when you earn the trust, when you earn the trust, it's like, oh, that's a double honor. You know, that's, that, that, that's, that's your badge right there. Oh, cool. Thank you, Twitter. <laughs> After all the good stuff I've said about you, <laughs> Twitter recommended me to your profile and led me to your stream with, with a, art type community. I enjoy the authentic conversations here. So I keep checking in to see how everyone is doing. Cool. Awesome. I felt like, I feel like I've seen your name on, on Professor Geek. So, so we actually like most people here, I didn't, when I started these streams, I didn't expect the, the prof uh, and his community to come, but it's, a, it's more or less popular art geek community, but with a touch of art um, commentary. Oh, cool. Okay, so I'm, you're an artist and a self-trained desktop music, uh, desktop producer and com composer. What uh, what software are you in? That would that would be interesting to know. Are you Ableton Live? Are you uh, Sonic Pi? If you're coding or Super Collider. Yeah, side chaining is usually used for compression on a lot of percussion. That is true. Um, side chaining, though, you can also call it that technique. I, I do believe it is called that technique. I don't think it's ducking. But when um, when when you have you have a signal like a voice, and then the voice drops and the music comes in, you know, like for at, at the beginning of a, a radio show or a podcast or something like that. So there's side chain for that too, where, where the, the, sig the main signal is the voice. And um, once that signal drops, the other signal comes in, like, like music or sound effects or something like that. Being a parrot is part of voice acting anyway. I, you know, that's another thing I would love to do. I, I, uh, I would love to do voiceover work. I know I can do voiceover work. Acting, that would probably take some training, but voiceover work for commercials or ads, oh yeah. In fact, like because I I have some experience in it, I'll listen. I'll listen to some voiceovers. I'm like, they they didn't think to do that, right? <laughs> Nether's Network says I do the accent thing too. I it's embarrassing. I, I I get I get really embarrassed. So like, okay, I'm I'm gonna. I'll, I'll tell you a quirk. My hair is getting all messed up. <clears throat> uh, I'll tell you a quirk. So I, I've got, I've got favorite accents. So my favorite accent on a man is North British, like North English, Manchester, Sheffield. Uh, that's, that's my absolute favorite accent on a man. I'm trying to like coax the prof to do some Sean Bean uh, uh, references or whatever, whatever he does. Um, he tried, <laughs> like, and he did well, but I, I was not paying attention. <laughs> I won't embarrass the prof on, on stream. Uh, I, it was my fault. I was not paying attention. He, he did a very good job sounding like Sean Bean. Um, but, 
so that's my favorite accent on uh, on a man. My favorite, I have two favorite accents for female, the Irish accent and the Indian accent. So, uh, you know, a, an Indian, native Indian uh, woman speaking English is like the, mo the most relaxing thing I could ever hear. I don't know why. There is something, actually, I, <laughs> I have this, I have this uh, girl who's from India. She's seven. And she's very inquisitive. She's so she's a violin student. She's so inquisitive and she's super theatrical. Like she's really funny. I, I love her very, very much. Uh, but she'll, she'll inquire some things. Like she'll ask me some things and then she'll have her Indian accent. And I kind of fall asleep to be honest. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, so I'm going to talk to you something. I'm going to say something smart about violin and music, but I'm really relaxed. There's there's just something about the the woman speaking with an Indian accent that just totally just I'm I'm asleep. Just I don't know why. It's something about the tone. I think it's something. Uh, it has to do with the, like the soft tip of the tongue at the at the with the vowels and then also at the tip of the teeth. I think that's probably what it is. Um, so when her mom, when I talked to her mom, well, she has a thicker accent because she's, she's uh, first generation. I think she's first generation from India and, um, or that's not how you say it. You know what I mean, guys? <laughs> yeah, you, 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 it's, it's late. I'm getting tired. Um, but her accent is thicker. And so when I'm talking with her, I'll actually start like accidentally imitating her accent. It's, it's not a slight, it's not a dig. I'm not making fun. It's just, my, I'm, I'm a total parrot when it comes to those things. It's like, oh man, I got to back off, man. <laughs> I got to back off. But sometimes it happens and I can't help it. Well, yes, I can't help it, but I have to, I have to concentrate really hard not to do it. Oh my my headphones are just the reason why I'm just adjusting them is I think it's getting caught in the earlobe or something. Well, ten says I, I surprised people one time when I when I imitated an ape, specifically a chimpanzee. Well, I mean they're so um they do have like vocal cords and and that vocal well they're louder than humans obviously but they do kind of have that humanness quality to their to their vocal cords and structure that's cool though i can i used to be able to imitate a common loon i'm not going to do that in the microphone into the microphone though but i used to i was in a i was in a choir i was in a performance at um at the university of washington i had to take an elective that involved chorus or choral singing and they they did this kind of random thing where it was these beautiful tones like the the chorus is just singing these meandering beautiful tones, but they needed animal calls, and I got I got the list of animals and I and I raised up my hand. I'm like, I think I can do a loon. Can I can I do a common? Can I be the common loon? And um, if you don't know what common loon is, like it, it's like Daffy Duck, you know, with the it's it's the black uh, kind of mallard looking duck with the 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 white strip around the neck and they have the beady red eyes but the, their calls are just so so gorgeous i mean if i get monetized and someone gives me a super chat i'll do a common loon on on stream but <laughs> i'm not monetized yet so but yeah someone wants it is someone like down the road says hey do do a common loon call i'll do a common loon call i'll do that for you guys so that's the animal I can imitate. Green Lion Girl says, you know I have a southern accent. That's true. You do have a southern accent. I can do a mean wicked witch laugh though too. I can hear that. I can hear that. Are you going to do that on the stream? Are you talking about w wicked witch of the west? Or just a wicked witch in general? Yeah, I could definitely imagine that. Oh, original characters. Oh, with the with the lower... With the lower S, okay, um, lowercase s. Thank you, thank you for that clarification. Okay, now guys, um, I'm I'm not that far behind chat, but I think I will step away for just a second, just to grab some water, and then we'll wrap it up in about 
15 or so minutes, but let me grab some water real quick. I will be right back. All right, I'm back with a good cup of cold water <laughs> right on the two hour mark. Okay, so where were we? Dr. Y says, the video I'm currently working on is going to mostly, uh, it's going to mostly go over coloring some old sketches I had done over some, some of my lunch breaks. I just have to think of a subject to talk over them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it could be something as, 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 um, natural as as the technique you're doing or or even something about you as an artist like when you started how how, how you got interested in sketch work and, and all that good stuff Doesn't, yeah I mean I I understand you know for for my commentary not commentary for my sound experimentation videos yeah I I do try to plan I have I ballpark okay I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna work on it Tuesday work a little more on Wednesday and then record it Wednesday night yeah I do I understand that planning part of it too. And now, now geek and community are talking about video games. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sound engraver square. Enix is fine. Um, that's what you mean. And sorry for the mix up. You released some cool stuff too. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, you you make a you make a really good point. I I always forget that's their name. And it 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 kind of bothers me. It bothers me. I, I understand it in, in some respect, but the word electronics. Okay, so when you have the word, okay, well, let me read what you said first before I get into that. Um, the, the word electronic artists has um, been corrupted by the most hated company that is EA. Yeah, they do call themselves electronic artists. That's okay. So this is interesting. Okay, so the word electronic, I think is really, really important to touch on. So I compose electronic music. What does that mean? It's it's things that are digitally produced, generated, and 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 mixed and and ultimately mastered. Now, on the one hand, acoustic music can technically be electronic music because everything's going into the microphone to be coded and, and recorded, and it is data to be had and to be processed and and to be put out there on on online and also in the physical media like a CD or, or vinyl or something like that. So yeah, I mean, essentially everything, every media you hear is, is electronic, but you know, electronic music has a very specific objective. It has a very specific style. Uh, it, it's, it's got a huge palette of genres, but when you think of electronic music, most of the time you are thinking, well, at least most of the time I'm thinking instrumental electronic music, something that is produced, like an instrument is produced electronically, a synth, using the basic wave table synthesis or the basic waves, you know, like the, the uh, sine tone, the triangle wave, the square wave, and the sawtooth wave, the four um, basic waves. And also, you know, wavetable sim synthesis, FM synthesis, uh, got cool things like granular synthesis with sound files, with your audio files. Why do I have a mark there? That's like, I think it's a bug bite. <laughs> anyway, um, what was I saying? 
So electronic artists, when I think of electronic artists, I actually think more interdisciplinary between, you know, the visual arts and also music. But if I say I'm a composer of electronic music, I'm, I'm also an artist. So it can be confusing. I, I, I could see where that is pretty confusing. But uh, I was looking at Scooter Tuta's comment. When Sound Engraver is away, the geeks will play. I have no idea what that means. The reference is. I, I, I wasn't away for too long. Um, but anyway. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, electronic. Because I am technically an electronic artist. I work in the electronic media. I produce... I compose and produce instruments that are electronically generated. I, I do play the violin and I love the acoustic violin and I would like to incorporate acoustic violin with electronic music. Uh, mostly. I think most of the time, I think that would be pretty important. But anyway, that's interesting. Getting a little sleepy. My, my, my mind is getting a little more sluggish. Yeah, Melissa Hare says, I'm listening to the stream and serving the web at the same time. Me and my sons. Yeah, I I, I, I think that's the, the role of streams, like listening to streams. I, when I listen to streams, I'm always doing something. Cooking, editing my music, doing email, um, doing miscellaneous things to get out. You know, just um, if it doesn't take any... I, I tend not to do streaming for things like that would take me, um, uh, that would have me listen you know i would need to listen to my music so i don't listen to talking not not all the time it depends like if i'm really fine tuning and tweaking no i can't hear talking but if it's like uh do i want this instrument or this instrument yeah i can actually i can know what i want and hear talking in the background writing writing emails no no i i if i if i have to write i i, I usually put the, the stream on pause or if it's live i i, I mute it but you know when I when I when I go on a stream in the chat, sometimes I don't get back to you guys for a long time because I'm I'm in the middle of cooking. I'm in the middle of cooking food and I've got food on my hands and all that. Dr. Y says, I started off my channel as an animation channel, but I found I like doing drawing videos more as of late. They're easier to manage on a weekly schedule. I like that. I you know, if you do things weekly, uh, your channel will pick up. Okay, I use several DAWs, including everything from Cubase to LF, uh, FL Studio. I remember um, mixing in Cubase. I remember liking that. That's cool. FL Studio, I never got into, um, but I looks like a very elegant interface from what I'm what I'm hearing, or from what I see. <clears throat> Wait, Daffy Duck is a common loon? That makes a lot of sense. Yep. Yep, that's but he doesn't he doesn't he does the wacky laughing that he does. He doesn't he doesn't do the common loon call. Like if you actually listen to like a CD or um you know yeah, go on YouTube and listen to common loons, like the call of common loons. They're they're quite beautiful. It's it's a beautiful haunting sound. Netters Network says, well, he is a Looney Tune. That's true. Oh, man, you're going to have to watch the replay, man. I stepped away for a while. What did I miss? Who knows? <laughs> I, I went to go get a drink of water or a cup of water. All right, we're going to wrap it up here shortly because I am getting a little tired and I'd like to unwind a little bit. Uh, Matthew Flynn says, it's funny that you mentioned Sean Bean because he's from South uh, Yorkshire, although Yorkshire, if I could say that right, uh, Yorkshire's uh, area itself is up north to begin with. Oh, yeah, interesting. I, I don't know how your country is divided. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Sean Bean was my celebrity crush for like 18 years until I met the prof. So now I don't think about him anymore. <laughs> Bormir who? <laughs> um. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think I'm going to get going too, Melissa. I think it's 
pretty much time. Okay, one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, you mentioned cooking sometimes. Uh, question, do you cook for yourself? If so, what's it like, Sound Engraver? So I do cook for myself. Um, I I cook, um, I pretty much, I, I, I do like my cooking. I, I, I just get better over time. Um, you know, it's really, by the way, it's really cheap to, to eat healthily. And if you're fine with eating the same stuff over and over again, you're, you're going to be healthy. You're going to have a, a good thin wallet. Wait, not, no, a thick wallet, a thick wallet. That's what I meant to say. Um, you just save a lot of money with, with buying groceries and, and, and getting the same stuff all the time. So what I usually do is I will always cook vegetables in, in vegetable oil, uh, kind of saute them, um, uh, spinach, the, the hot colored peppers, like red, orange, yellow. I'm, I'm not a green pepper fan. I just never care for green peppers, uh, spinach, those peppers, onions and garlic. So those I, I eat every night. I eat every night and, um, and then I'll mix it with, you know, cayenne pepper and, um, some, uh, some other spices and, I'll, I'll choose meats between uh, white fish, like um, tilapia. What's the other one I get? Cod. I've been eating cod more. Um, so that's that's cod and then mussels. And then I've actually been eating a little bit more meat outside of fish, like chicken or uh, turkey. I think I eat ground turkey sometimes. Uh, I, I maybe pork, not pork that much. I hardly eat red meat. I just, uh, I can't digest it that well. But um, if I have, if there's like a case where I have like three or four days of absolutely low energy, that's like, I feel like that's my body saying, I have a little meat this time, you know? So I'll have red meat maybe once every two months or three months. I don't need it that often. Um, but when I do feel very sluggish, it's like, oh, it might be time to have a little red meat for, for the week. And then, um, but I mostly eat fish and then I will cook it with rice. I will sometimes cook it with couscous. Couscous is really good, especially with mus mussels, but, um, couscous is really high in carbs. It's really fattening. It's delicious. And they, and people say it's healthy, but it's not healthy if you eat it in, in large quantities. So I try to go for um, brown rice or, you know, a healthier version of rice. Like, like you see in, um, I think you, you see the mixes in Indian food that that might be a little healthier. I'm not sure. So that's usually, I'm pretty basic there. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much I, what I make for dinner. But when fan man's on stream on Friday nights, sometimes, man, I just get a, I get a, um, American flatbread frozen pizza. If you've never had American flatbread frozen pizza, it is the best frozen pizza on the planet. Hopefully your grocery store has them. Try it out. They are expensive. I, I get them on sale for $6 and it feeds, it feeds one person. Um, it feeds a, it's a lot for one person, but you, if you have a family, you probably need two or three. So it is, it's, it's expensive frozen pizza. Um, if you get more than one, but oh my goodness, it is so good. It's like restaurant pizza. It's very, very good. <clears throat> and I always feel like eating pizza when I listen to Fan Man on, on stream because he has a thing for pizza. So anyway. Okay, so uh, okay, I got I gotta I gotta share the story now. Now that Samuel Brock, Proctor brought it up. Sorry, prof. Are you you won't be mad at me? You can you can share an embarrassing story about me on, on your stream tomorrow. Um, so yeah, when, when Samuel Proctor, uh, says, uh, man, I haven't heard Sean Bean in a long time, so I don't know if I can imitate him. Um, one does, one does not simply walk into Mordor. I don't think that's good. If that's hard to say, Mordor is a hard word to say. One, one does not simply walk into Mordor. Uh, I, I don't think I'm doing it justice. Um, so... <laughs> I was concentrating on something. I was concentrating on something on the computer. And, and, and the prof uh, like comes up next to me and he tries to say that line. And then like something happens where he, I'm not paying attention really what he says, but I feel like a little bit of spit on my forehead. I said, you spit on my forehead. And, uh, and I hadn't realized he was trying to imitate Sean Bean. <laughs> 
And um, and I I just uh, I, I feel bad, but I, I still hope I still hope he practices the North English accent because now now um, Matthew Flynn, am I correct that that is North English, right? Am I correct to saying that? I don't know how your country is divided regionally, but um, but I want I want the prof to oh more door, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's not Mr. Bean. That's that's a different person all altogether. Uh, that moment was gone. I'll never say it again. No, no, no. Like here's the deal: if I do Bastila, you have to do Sean Bean. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's 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 the agreement. <laughs> um, I don't know any other lines really. Um, I'll have to think of some some stuff. But anyway, I'm getting really sleepy. But uh, what am I saying with that? Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I just totally lost my train of thought. Yeah, but anyway, that that poor embarrassing story. But uh, yeah, it takes practice. It takes practice. But you know, I, I could do I could do Bastila. We need we need the prof to do more uh, Knights of the Old Republic streams so I can learn more lines that Bastila says so I can do some more Bastila uh, imitation. Oh yeah, that's a good line. They have a cave troll. That's right. But uh, oh yeah, let's actually I, I see I see people talk about what, what's going on this week. So anyway, this week let's start with Tuesday. Yeah, I think I think I'm done. I'm, I'm getting really sleepy, so let's just kind of do a, a wrap up. Um, this Tuesday we have w, WCR, right? Wolf Ten on uh, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, two thirty. Go ahead and name your topics or and or special guests. Uh, so be on the lookout for uh, Wolf Wolf Command Rambles on Wolf Ten's channel, Tuesday and Thursday, two thirty Eastern Time. Then we have Catholic Bible Geek Channel, which we are doing our second. Uh, um, well, it's not like it's not the second chapter, but it's the second part of um, our, our course of chapters with the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the fifth installment, the chronicle chronological installment of the Chronicles of Narnia, but by C.S. Lewis, and that is with Big Al presents. That's going to be fun. Uh, it, I mean, it's a really intense adventure story uh, for, for children. So that will be 9 p.m. I believe. I think that's correct. 9 p.m. Wednesdays, of course, we've got Soundtracks with Birdman with Daniel Heron and Agent Boomer. I am not sure what they're doing. I feel like there's a guest. Big Al, are you on that this week? I feel like you're on Soundtracks with Birdman this week. But I, I can't remember what, what movie you guys are looking over. But that will be Wednesday night, 8.30, I think. Wednesday at 8 30 Eastern time. We also have Green Lion Girls, I think, Final Fantasy VII remake on Wednesday nights as well. If if I'm done editing or recording, I'll try to uh, pop in and say hi. It, it just depends on my workflow, of course. So we have that going Wednesday. We also have um, Second Cup Cafe by Fan Man on Wednesdays and Fridays, ballparking 11 to noon p.m. Eastern time. We've God, what's what's going on with Catholic Bible Geek? Actually, I don't know what's going on with Catholic Bible Geek on uh, Thursday because I feel like there's a big change. I know the Kenobi book study has been moved down to or moved up, moved up. Sorry, I think of a lower number as down, but I think it's been moved up to 9 p.m. instead of 10 p.m. on the Professor Geek channel. So that's that's going on there, but I'm not sure what's happening with. Catholic Bible Geek channel. The uh, my impression is that he's going to do a uh, record a video and 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 publish it and then maybe do streaming for, for questions and answers or maybe skip the streaming altogether. I'm not quite sure. So a clarification would be awesome. But if anything, we can check out the Facebook group page and and, and see what's going on there. All right. It looks like we've got Schooner Tuna and the Lady of Valor, Leia plus size. I think Tuesday this time. Oh, no, no. Scooter Tuna is on Tuesday and Leia Plus Size is on Thursday. Uh, back with a vengeance on body positivity. 
And um, that, that'd be an interesting topic to cover. And then also um, Days of Future, Future Past with uh, X-Men commentary with Schooner Tuner. Schoon, Schooner Tuna. Good. And then I think, and then we've got, we've got Green Lion Girl with her discussion. Oh, with, with Wolf 10 on um, the Final Fantasy VII remake. That's cool. That's cool. And then, oh no, not uh, just discussion with Wolf 10, whatever you are discussing at 6 p.m. And then 9 p.m. for the Final Fantasy stream, the remake. And then Friday, the original. That's cool uh, on 6 p.m. That's cool. And then we've got Matthew Flynn doing his Sunday commentaries with Troy Pacelli. Um, uh, celebrating the lives of Ronnie Baker. Good. Cool. Good. And I'm sure just be on the lookout. Oh, you know, I, I forgot to mention this last stream, uh, but, uh, you know, always tune in Sunday nights for H. Boomer with his, um, with he and uh, Troy's uh, Geeky Gamers, uh, not Gamers, Geeky, ge geeky Geezers stream. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Oh, yes. And Internet, Netters Network has a rewatch on her channel, Artificial Intelligence. So 10 p.m. I'm sure on Saturday night. So that would be good. Alrighty. And then, you know, you're at, you know, anime rewatches, you know, Mr. Matchstick usually has um, a few things and then um, everyone else has anything. So, you know, the best way, you know, the, the more you do this, guys, the less I can, you know, plug for you. So you can, you, you know, you could plug on the, on the chat, of course, I might miss it or, or, you know, um, continue wrapping things up here, but you know, where can you look out for all this stuff? Well, first of all, you can look out, um, uh, you know, watch out for these things on the Professor Geek Facebook group page. Uh, that's all the announcements and, and commentary are there. And so I think I will wrap it up now. Sound experimentation every Thursday. Some extra commentary, give or take, every Saturday while parking. And then, of course, live commentary uh, on Monday nights. So Fixed commentary Saturday and then live commentary Monday nights. So until I see you next, keep producing the art you love and I will catch you later.